So let's pray first. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege opportunity, especially for this time where we can interact with each other in dialogue, exchange ideas, and really, really, really masticate on what it is that uh, we believe is your will for us specifically for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We believe we have a unique mission and a unique assignment, and we want to be able to fulfill that to the glory of your name. So I'm praying that you will help all of us in this journey. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How much time do we have? Oh. What, five? Have mercy. Um, so I want to say a couple of things. I, I got to first start off. Several disclaimers are, are needed. I love the message and the experience that I believe that God has given to Seventh-day Adventists. If you believe that, say amen. 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 We are with them. Um, however, I think that there are some there are some things that should change that comfortably fit within the confines of Scripture that we need to be mindful of. And referring back to my earlier comments in my message, I, I, I really feel like we have the answer, the theological, we got the message that answers almost every question. It answers atheism, it answers agnosticism, it answers whatever denomination. Of, I really feel like the message that God has given us rightly understood, we should be growing by leaps and bounds. Especially, we should not be losing second, third generation Adventists who have been raised in this. But let's just be honest. I will be honest for you. And I think I can speak I think I can speak with some level of credibility because I am a Seventh-day Adventist pastor's son. My mother was an attorney for the general conference in risk management. You, you don't get no more Adventist than that. Am I right, Lachey? I Listen, I am a part of the Adventist aristocracy. <laughs> I have a right to speak. <laughs> and having said that, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home where my parents, man, they lifted up Jesus. And they were ministry minded. We had over 70 people to live in our home from the time that I was a youngster until I left for college. My parents were always picking up people off the streets and they lived with us. So, you know, that really was the impetus behind me being a pastor, not because I like preaching. Like, you know, some people want to be pastors and, and because they want to preach. Man, I was interested in pastoring because, man, I saw my parents through Friday night worship over haystacks change people's lives there's one guy in particular he came off the streets he went, well we were coming back from school i went to uh i guess it would be considered primary school here um we would call it elementary yeah, yeah. so i was i was coming from school and my father was, was taking us home and there was a liquor store on the corner of the liquor store there was a, a gentleman and he had a 40 ounce of uh of, of beer and he was, he was already drunk and he was about to take that down. And my dad pulls the car over. I mean, this is my upbringing. My dad pulls, seven minutes minister. My dad pulls, we're in the hood too. Like, you know what I mean? I mean, like seriously, now this is Southeast Washington, DC. Southeast DC is like two Bronx and a Brooklyn. I mean, it's, it's bad, right? My dad pulls the car over, gets out of the car and I see an altercation. I don't, we don't hear what's going on. We, I just see my father in his face. He's, you know, in his drunken stupor in his face. All I know is that whatever happened, my dad won, and that guy got in the car. He stank, smelled like alcohol, and he ended up living with us for the next seven years. He went from being addicted to everything. I'm, I'm saying everything. As a matter of fact, this same gentleman had AIDS. He, he was diagnosed with AIDS. I don't, I, I, I don't know why he's still alive. No, other than God healed him. I'm serious. I mean, he, every imaginable um, pathology and addiction he had, and he went from that guy to personal ministries leader, to head elder, to married, to worldwide evangelist. He and his wife have traveled all over the world. And so, that, so you have to understand, I saw grace. That's what I saw. That's what I saw. Now, here's the problem. 
what I saw at home and what I experienced at church were in conflict with each other. So when I end up at Oakwood and at Andrews, my, my frame of reference for what church should be like is not based on um, the churches that we attended because they were, they were driving a lot of people away from Christ. Don't get me wrong. The Seventh Adventist Church has done a good job over the years of doing evangelism. However, let me say this. There is a kind of person that we produce that comes in the church thankful and grateful. But over time, they become spiritually arrogant, dogmatic, legalistic. What I saw in church was different. I mean, now, now help me out now. I want to make sure that we're all speaking the same, same language here. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right, good. I just, I just want to make sure we're connecting. Uh, you know, everybody's, America, everybody, people see America as being so liberal. Uh, maybe comparatively, but for the most part, Adventism in America is still very traditional. There are some examples. Y'all see Breath of Life and you see stuff like that and you may. But I mean, for the most part, 70% of our young adults are leaving the church. And, and I want to say this. And then I'm gonna share, I want to share with you just a little bit. Then we're going to open up a dialogue. This is my run Edmund saying this. And I believe you can back up what I'm saying from not only the Bible, but the spirit of prophecy. I think the reason why we are not drawing, but we are repelling our own people is because of this preoccupation with behavior modification. Y'all know what I'm saying when I say that, right? We are obsessed with getting people to act and look a certain way. More so than obsessed with grace. Matter of fact, Adventists are scared of everything. We're scared of the movies. We're scared of jewelry. We're scared of, we're scared of, you know, well, we're, we're only, we're only afraid of meat at church. <laughs> oh yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. <laughs> so we're, listen, and here, you know what else we're scared of? We're scared of Jesus. We are scared of Jesus. I have had people accuse me of preaching too much about Jesus, we need to preach the meat of the word, which are our fundamental beliefs, teachings, and doctrines. And, I, and what I want to establish today, and I think it's important for me to do this today, so that for the rest of the week, at least you guys will know where I'm coming from, that I'm not preaching heresy, especially if you are a new Adventist, you need to understand what Adventism is about. If you ask the average person, what does it mean to be Adventist? You will hear so many different answers, and I'm going to do that right now. So before I talk about the essence of Adventism, tell me in your own words, what is an Adventist? What's the essence of Adventism? Anybody? To prepare for the second coming of Jesus. The three angels' message. These are very good answers. Anybody else? Sabbath keepers. Sabbath keepers. All right. That's a real answer right there. Yes. <laughs> All right. What else? What does it mean to be Adventist? Not eating meat. Not eating meat. <laughs> hey, listen, you're late now. You can't. I mean, it's not even milk and, and dairy anymore. And now vegan is not enough. You got to be plant based. <laughs> Like, man, I thought, man, I, I thought I was overcoming, man. And then they, they changed that thing on me, man. Woo. Anybody, I see a hand back there. Christ-centered. Ah, a wise man. A wise, that's a good answer. That's, uh, that's generally not the answer that we get. Now, let's, let's reframe the question. Outside of Adventism, how would you... Describe Adventism if you weren't an Adventist. What do they know about us? What do they hand right here? A cult. They eat cold food on Sabbath. Oh, but can we can't heat it up right here? You don't have to speak louder. Uh huh. You confuse SDA with Jehovah's Witness. That happens a lot, by the way. In the back, you know. They don't celebrate Christmas. Yes. We actually, do, we had to do a whole series on our church called Why? Just to answer a bunch of those questions. My hand right here. Mm -hmm. 
Hypocritical. Ooh, man, that's cold blooded. <laughs> By the way, for, listen, anybody who's like, you know, rah rah Adventism, like this is not, we're not being disrespectful right now. We're just, we're just, we're just talking, okay? Yes, my brother in the back. Ellen White. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, Google Adventism. We, we got to fix that, by the way. There's a way, there's an algorithm where you can fix that, where the majority of the stuff that comes up about us can be positive. Somebody needs to call the GC and tell them to fix that. Because the minute you put Adventism in, a bunch of crazy stuff comes up first. That can be fixed. That can be fixed. Uh, let, me, let me get some hands. Uh, I saw, oh, yes, right here. Go ahead, sis. We're known to know the Bible well. That's very true. Yes. Don't wear earrings. Don't wear earrings. Uh, now, 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 notice how you... You said earring. You didn't say jewelry. Huh? Yeah. Uh, ha, ha, I caught that. <laughs> a brooch would be worn, though. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Say that one more time. Dress like teachers? Break that down. Formal, formal. Interesting. By the way, that's not even very, that's not Adventist at all. By the way, the, the dress, the way we dress up, the jewel, jewelry, the it's called the plain dress movement. We came out of the Anabaptists and that's, you know, Methodists, so forth and so on. So the plain dress movement was an idea that came from Charles Wesley. And one of the things that he also said in that list is that men should not shave their beards. But notice the only things that made it out into Adventism were the things pertaining to women. But none of the things for men. But I, just, I digress. I digress. That's a whole nother. If you want to hear more about that, go to our, our Facebook page and you can listen to the sermon, uh, Why, the Why series, and it's all there. Let me get a few more. What do they say about us? Let's take a couple more. Anybody over here? Yes. Fanatics. A cult. Yes. Mm -hmm. We sing well. This is true. This is true. Old Testament people. Man, it's crazy. I was on, we were coming from Qatar. Uh, here, yes, last night or early in the morning, whatever. And I uh, happened to talk to a guy who's from South Africa and he was actually lives in Houston. So we began to talk. And so he was like, where are you going to South Africa for? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going for work. I never tell people, listen, <laughs> sis, they have to corner me for me to tell them I'm a pastor. I like, I like to see how people, I want to see, I, I like people with their guards down and not to vote. Okay. I'm not ashamed. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ministry tactic. Anyway, so uh, he kept cornering me. So for what business? I said, I have to speak. <laughs> really, what are you speaking about? Uh, I said, religious matters. And he said, oh, okay, so what denomination are you? And of course, I was like, I'm Seventh-day Adventist. And the first thing he says, he says, you know, Paul says that we should not judge any man according to <laughs> his days of holidays. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, I agree that no man can judge. But God can. <laughs> yeah, I agree. But, but anyway, his perception of us, first thing that came to his mind was, was, was Sabbath. And that he wanted to check me that we were, we were, we were law keepers. And we had not, he said to his underlying messages, they don't believe in, in grace. Now, let me just go ahead and say this now. You do know we are not under the law. We are under grace. It's, it's, you can still be Adventist and say that. And what that simply means is we are not under the law as a way of salvation. But you have to hope, praise God that the Sabbath school lesson, finally, finally, how long has it been since the book of Galatians? You know, Adventists are scared of Galatians because Galatians really comes against the law, not just the ceremonial, but Ellen White says the moral law. So when, when, the, when in Galatians, it says that by the works of the law, no man is justified. It's not talking about the ceremonial law. It's talking about the Ten Commandments. You're not justified by Sabbath keeping. It's hard for us to receive that. Well, anyway, so you get the picture. So based on your answers, either for yourself or for the world, I want to go with the senior man in the room. 86 years old, I believe he is. Is that right? What's my brother's name? 85? Uncle Ted? Uncle David? Oh, Dave. Uncle Dave. And how old are you, Uncle Dave? Oh, 77. Or, 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 or Errol, you gave me false information. Oh, it's another man. Oh, so many, so many, so many. 77. It has nothing to do with your looks. I'll tell you that. So anyway, his answer is correct. I'm trying to fix it, right? I'm doing everything I can. Uh, 
It was the best answer in the whole room. Yes, it was. But he said Christ. Honestly, now, people don't know this. The, the origins of Adventism, we actually were designed so that people would say that they are Christ-centered. But what we have experienced is a term I like to use called mission drift. And it's all documented. And I want to walk you through what happened. It's, it's not going to be boring, but there's some information I need to give you. Because you need to understand why we are having this conflict in our church right now with all of all, any conflict you can name. It has its roots in some controversies that happened in our church 150 years ago or more. There's a reason why there's a struggle between legalism and liberalism. And I will tell you this, liberalism is the birth child of legalism. Liberalism, do whatever we want, is a reaction to legalism. There's, you would not have liberalism if there was no legalism. Just, are, are we, I know there's a lot of isms, but are we on the same page here? All right, now you ready for this? Are you ready for this? This is, this, like, this is good stuff here. All right. Are we intellectual? Yeah. Got brains here, right? All right. All right, here we go. Check this out. So notice what Galatians says. It says, read that everybody. For in what? Neither what? Nor what? Avails what? But what? What Paul is saying is, now circumcision basically is another way of saying the whole law. If you were circumcised, that meant you had to keep the whole law. So that includes the commandments, the ceremonial law, and the dietary laws. All of them. Sabbath, everything. What Paul is saying is, is he says, for in Christ, neither is there law keeping, and it doesn't avail anything. That's tough for an Adventist to receive, because our whole existence has been built on keep the law, keep the law, keep the law. Right? Performance. But notice what he says our faith is based on. But faith working through what? All right, now, this is, this is really cool stuff right here if you are a geek. If you're a nerd, you're going to like this. Now, the, the, the Greek word for working through love, faith works through love, is the word energo. What does that sound like, energo? Energy. <laughs> oh, that's good, right? Do you, somebody, come on, preach this for me. What is, what's, what's Paul saying? What is he saying? What, what creates, let's, let, me, let, me, let me slide back here. Let me go back. Uh, oh, go back for me. Whoever's there, just go back a couple of slides. I can only, I don't know how to go forward. Watch this. He says, what really matters? Nothing else matters except this faith working, working is the word energy, right? Faith working through love. So what energizes love? Come on, somebody, come on, somebody and vice versa. Love energizes faith. So, so here's the thing. The thing that moves us to live as good Adventists is not rules, but love. Love produces the right behavior. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, enjoy, I enjoy my own preaching. You should. If, if you don't know, seriously, if you don't know, it's a problem. That's, that's good stuff, yo. Like, righteousness by faith is energized by what? All right, so let's say it together. Righteousness by faith is energized by love. Now, when we say righteousness, we are talking not about a behavior, but about a, but about a person. Righteousness is a person. What did I say, everybody? Did that just hit you? Your righteousness is contingent upon a relationship with a person and not behavior. The Bible said, Christ said, he says, I am Christ, your righteousness. Your righteousness is not a thing, it's a person. Hallelujah. You could have had the worst day on the planet yesterday. You ask Christ to cover you and Christ looks at you as if you have never sinned. One of the number one reasons why people don't go to church, because I have to get myself together. That is blasphemy. That's anti-Bible. 
And if we were as loving as we should be and as grace oriented as we could be, then people would never say that. The only way people would say, I got to get myself together before they get here is because they somehow feel like you have it together. That's why we ought not send a message to the world that we have it together. Anybody familiar with the Wizard of Oz? One of my pastor friends wrote a great article uh, in Spectrum. I know, I mean, it was in Spectrum. But anyway, it's a great article on, and he used this uh, on, on Adventism. And he used this illustration of the, uh, the Wizard of Oz. You know the whole story of the Wizard of Oz, right? And so the Wizard of Oz, he, 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 he portrays himself to be this all-powerful wizard that has the keys to life, right? But what happens? They end up finding out that there's no wizard after all. But that, in fact, it's just a, 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 a little man behind... A, a microphone and everything. He's a, he's, he's, it's a myth, right? He said, that's Adventism. He says, we have sold to people that we're the Wizard of Oz and we have the solutions to life. But really, we should have been saying, we know the solution to life. We're just a, a little old man. See, we got to reverse this whole we're really, really good people and shift it to more. We're really, really human and in need of God's grace, just like you. That's attractive. Are we together? Do, all right. Do we need to pause? Quick questions before I, I make a move, because I'm about to make a strong move right now. Any, any questions? OK. All right. Oh, snap. What happened? I, lo I lost uh, I lost contact. Go to the next slide for me. All right, now, watch what Ellen White says. I'm about to, I'm, I know, some of us don't like history, but you're gonna, this will be fun. Trust me. Ellen says this. She says, love is what? Ooh, this is good, man. Intellectual and moral what? Are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it. There are some people who feel like love is uh, it's just, uh, it's just love. It's, it's weak. Love is the power. To give you not only intellectual strength, but more to say no to sin. How do you think Joseph looked at Potiphar's wife, who probably was butt naked? Let's, I mean, I know y'all been watching uh, like the Prince of Egypt and whatever. Is it, what's, what is it, Joseph? Or, you know, come on. Let's, uh, uh, okay, y'all didn't know I was real like that, didn't you? Okay. You didn't want them? Okay. Okay, okay let, let's just be honest. You think she was, you think uh, Potiphar's wife was standing there in a muumuu? Like one of those gowns with rollers in her hair? When she was trying to lure him in to a sex trap? You think so? She came at him with full force. How many Adventist good Christian men could have resisted that temptation under those circumstances? Now, if there was anybody who had an excuse, if you would say, hey, man, this guy's been through a lot. His, his family, they, they had two options. Let's kill him or sell him in slavery. Like, like if anybody will, will say, man, I had a rough background and you can understand why they did, did what they did, it would be Joseph, right? He's in slavery. You know, come on. You're like, oh man, it's all good, man. Do what you got to do and repent later, right? <laughs> what did Joe, now Joe, notice, notice Joseph's response. It wasn't, look, he says, how can I do this thing and sin against God? It's totally love and relationship that kept him. So I know what I'm talking about, especially after being a porn addict for eight years. Man, the thing that brought about deliverance in my life was not somebody telling me how to behave. It was Christ and the grace of God experience in my life that made me so in love with him that I don't want to hurt him. That's strength. That's power. Can we keep stepping? I've got dynamite coming. Seriously. I'm telling you, I wish the world church could get a hold of this. Seriously. Go ahead. Next. Oh, oh yes, that it? Love cannot live without what? See? So stop being scared of grace. And every act increases, strengthens, and extends it. Love will gain the victory. Now, this is Ellen White here. This is the same person we use for some of the most legalistic and crazy things we do in the church. And she's telling us how to do things. Go to the next one. All right, now. Then 1844. All right, so let me, now let me help you out. The early, er, early Adventism started around the 1840s, right? Does everybody know this? Okay. The Adventist church started like in the 1840s in New England, in, in America. All right? Group of people who basically were really courageous to leave their churches with all that social pressure because of their love for the Bible and the Bible alone and not tradition. Adventism is built on being radical. Mm -hmm. 
We're not talking about stepping away from your denomination in 2017. We're talking about doing it in the 1800s where everybody was a Christian. And to start something new. All right, so our roots were in challenge the system, challenge the system, challenge the system. That was our roots. Then along the way, go to the next one. You know, the great disappointment happened, so forth and so on. But the timing of Adventism is critical for you to understand why we exist. There was what I would call the reign of bad religion. Does anybody know what I, what was the reign of bad religion? It happened for about 1260 years. Anybody know? The Roman Catholic Church, the dark ages, the Roman Catholic Church was Christianity for about 1200 years. That was the reign of bad religion. And, 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 and they didn't just, a lot of people think that Catholicism's influence is just Sunday worship. Look, just about, there are so many things we do, even as Adventists, that are Catholic. Now, I'm going to say something, y'all going to get mad, but it's all right. The way we do communion is like totally Catholic. Like they have like a white table and, you know, all that stuff. Where, where, where y'all get that from? Or to view objects as holy. It's Catholic. Holy buildings, holy tables. Holy, holy cups. That's totally Catholic. Righteousness by works. Totally Catholic. So, but listen, let's be, let's, let's be kind to our church. Man, our history is 1260 years of that. The Protestant Reformation was a reaction to that. We were birthed out of the Protestant Reformation. So, yes, there are going to be some entanglements towards that. So I'm not knocking us. And listen, there's nothing wrong with tradition so far as tradition begins to eclipse the word of God. You got to keep tradition in balance. The minute you're fighting more for, tra for tradition than you are for the word, that's when tradition is a problem. So you have this air reign of bad religion, and then you have this reaction to modern atheism. So simultaneously, so, oh, please, uh, this is really geeky and nerdy, but you have to get this. So while the Catholic Church has created this horrible picture of God, eternal torment in hell, you have to pay your way out. The, uh, uh, the, the killing, the killings and, and, and of, of martyrs and all the stuff that was happening, taking the Bibles away from the people for 12 or 60 years, they dominated the world. So you know what the reaction was to many? In France, the reaction was that if that's God, we don't want him at all. And thus the Renaissance where people began to resist and to reject God altogether, thus the birth of modern atheism. Yeah. The birth, so you see how you see how you see how bad religion creates liberalism. Yeah. So so now you have this atheistic movement and so forth and so on. And and, and during this time, I'm so excited about this. This is I'm sorry, like and during this era, around the 1800s, 1700, 1800s. God said, I need a movement, Revelation 10, to come up to solve the problem of bad religion. God is a monster. He's after you. He's trying to burn you forever and ever if you don't behave right. And we need a movement that's going to respond to the reaction of atheism that God it, it can't be like that. So there's no God at all. So who is that movement that comes up during that time frame? To paint a beautiful picture of a gracious God. Like the reason why we exist is to say God is not like that. And he's not like this. He is gracious and loving. That's why you're an Adventist. Your role as an Adventist is to help remove the confusion in this world. That God is mean, angry, vindictive, temperamental. And wants you to behave right in order to win his love. The reason why Adventists exist is to paint a picture of a, of a unilateral love that expects nothing in return except faith. This is, let me explain to you what salvation is. Salvation is essentially this. I, I saved you. I already did it. I already did it. Now I need you to believe I did it. And I believe that if you believe that I did it, that belief is powerful enough to produce good behavior in you. But that's hard for any human being to believe because all your life you grew up with performance and reward. Yes. Performance and reward. Yes. If you're good, if, if, listen, you work, if those of you who go to work every day, it's performance and reward. They don't pay you at the beginning of the week. <laughs> right? They probably should though. Actually, 
People like Google, a place like Google and Amazon, they're, whole, they're reorienting their whole work, workplace culture. It's no longer based on performance. It's based on tasks. And people are actually performing better under those constraints than, than people are in, corporate, in the corporate sector where they, you know, it's really high risk, high reward and competitive and stuff like that. That's because we're built for love, man. All right, next one. All right, so we, you, you kind of get a reason why Adventists came into existence, right? To reframe the picture of God, to say, that's not God, this is God. What is God? God is love. But then, go to the next one. As we begin to, you remember I, I, I made that statement in, the, in this morning's service about argumentative discourses? Yeah. So this is how Adventism would go into a city in our early days. When we started understanding these truths that when you die, you don't go to heaven. And there's no such thing as eternal uh, torment in hell and the second coming of Christ and Christ and his, his, his mediatory work, all these good in the Sabbath. We got a little arrogant. So we would go into cities and we would challenge the Sunday preacher to a debate with the Adventist preacher. This was our method of evangelism, argumentative discourses. Oh, power went out. Oh, that's cool. Thank God I got it on my phone, right? So listen, so they, <laughs> it's crazy. So they would go and challenge the Sunday preacher. Um, we, we, I, I challenge you, and if, and, if, and if you can prove that the Sabbath is not the Sabbath, then I'll give you some money. You know, you ever heard that before, right? So they would challenge these preachers. They would argue and debate them and humiliate them. And so, as you can see, we got more and more proud and arrogant. And so our method of winning people was not with love, but our method of winning people was with what, everybody? Really fear. How many, how many of you grew up scared to go to hell? <laughs> Some of you scared to go to hell still. And I'm telling you, if you really understood the gospel, the Bible says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has to do with what? Punishment. That's Bible. Notice what Ellen says here. She's, she's, she's disturbed by, by what's going on in the church. I want to make sure we're at the right... Uh, yes. So, so notice what she says. Because we started getting really, really arrogant that we knew stuff that other people didn't know. So this is what she said. And I talked about it earlier. She said this. She says, the words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. Talking specifically about the leadership of the Adventist church. Y'all know Ad Ellen White and the leadership got into it. Yeah. You know, that's why she ended up in Australia. Yeah. You know, that's why Steps to Christ was written, Desire of Ages, all those books about Jesus. Because of leadership that was trying to silence her about the gospel. I'm telling you, man, this is a radical movement. I'm telling you. Ellen White was a G. Okay, no, I'm sorry. She's a gangster, man. Like, she would check these conference presidents. Like, yo, y'all are, you're going in a different direction. She was like, this represents perfect. She, uh, watch the next one. Watch what she says. She says, the Lord, no, this is crazy. She, she's talking about the evidence. She says, the Lord has seen our backslidings and he has a controversy with his people. Like, our whole thing is the great controversy. She's like, no, no, no. God has a controversy with Adventists. Now, can I show you why? Let's, let's look, look at the diagnosis. Go to the next one. So here's the diagnosis. Here was our issue. And you've got to be clear on this. And I believe this will help you. In Selective Messages, Volume 2, page 87, she says this. She says, the truth for this time is broad, and it's what? Far-reaching, embracing what? Many. Many doctrines. All the doctrines that, we, that we've been taught and we know, okay? Now, now stay, now, buckle your seatbelts. Watch what she says here. Go to the next one. She says, but these doctrines are not detached items. Like, I wish I had a whiteboard. Like, so it's not like, so like, so like in a typical evangelistic meeting, you start off like with prophecy to prove that the Bible is the Bible and you just preach doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. And then at some point you preach one sermon on Jesus. That's around baptism. Oh, so manipulative, right? What Ellen is saying is, is no, we don't have 29 doctrines. It's 29 now, right? Because they added Christian education. It used to be 28. They vote, I believe they voted Christian education at the recent... You can't keep up, can you? Can't keep up. Right. So, so notice what she's saying. She was like, we don't have... All right, for your reference. We don't have 28 fundamental beliefs. We have one. She says they're not detached items, which mean little. They are united by golden threads, forming a complete whole with what? Adventism should be the most Christ-centered out of all the churches. Let me... Oh, here. Oh, this is good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Lord just gave this to me. The best place for people to find love in all of Stanton, the city, or Johannesburg. I'm even going to go there. 
The best place for them to find love should be Metro, Metro Mission. And if they can't find him here, tell them, to, uh, tell them where to go to find him. If there's anything we should be competing in, you all need to be competing in who is the most loving congregation in this city. When people come in here, they ought to make up their mind before the sermon is preached that they cannot go anywhere else. It's too much love. They got loved in the parking lot. They got loved that they walked in. That's Adventism. We're supposed to outlove everybody. We're supposed to outchrist everybody. Can I go on? Yeah. All right. Is it making sense? Yeah. All right, go to the next one. Now listen what she says. This is the diagnosis. This is Ellen White. She's saying this to the top brass in the church. She says to them, Uriah Smith and these guys, man, they try to silence her. She said to them with, with her finger in their face, she says the preaching of Christ has been strangely neglected by our people. Picture that, Ellen White, like she's a prophet. <laughs> this is the same woman who was, uh, went to hear one brother preach. And as he was preaching, she stood up in the middle of his sermon and said, my brother, sit down. You have not been with the Lord. <laughs> like, can you imagine pastoring in the days of Ellen White? And, and you're, the, you're the guest preacher and Ellen White comes in. <laughs> I'll be like, my sister, the Lord, has, the Lord has convinced me that you should preach today. <laughs> Ellen is like, no, look, you guys, l l I want you to look, look, it's, there's nothing wrong with being constructively critical about our church. Yeah. Ellen White was, she was like, man, y'all are neglecting the preaching strangely. We're not talking about Jesus. Next one. It says the love God has been largely dwelt upon and has been presented to congregations almost as destitute of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus Christ. And his relation to the law, as was the offering of Cain. <laughs> oh, I, <love> this. <laughs> I just love this woman, man. She's an assassin, man. <laughs> go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. She says, "There now." Oh, this is beautiful. Listen, for those of you who are like, uh, you know, all those answers that we heard, we, we need to rely on my brother. Uh, is it David in the back? Yeah, his answer was it. There is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in the searching of the scriptures: Christ. And him crucified. Every other truth is invested with influence and power corresponding to its relationship to this theme. We are Christians. First. Christian is my identity. Adventism is my mission. Look at your neighbor and say that was good. That's your neighbor. Say that was good. That was good. That was good. That was good, man. That wasn't, that wasn't mine. I can't take credit for it. John Nixon Jr., my, my friend, he said that, but, uh, oh man, is that, does that work? I'm a Christian first. I'm a follower of Christ. What is my mission? To paint the most beautiful picture of Christ to the world. To correct the bad religion that's out there that paints God as anything less than love. That's why you're an Adventist. Come on, put your hands together. Praise the Lord. Come on, come on. Now, now, now. Let's keep, let, me say, let me say what happened. Now, the, all this sounds good, doesn't it? You have to be asking yourself, well, what happened? Like, what happened? Like, really, what happened that we would put out girls for getting pregnant out of wedlock and not the dudes? Like, <laughs> what happened? What happened? Like, like, how did we get caught up in, in this racial thing that we got going on? Why are we fussing and fighting more about ordinations? them fussing and fighting about why we're not as gracious and as Christ-centered as we should be. I'm not going to even, I'm, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to say anything about women's ordination, so I, but I will say this to you, like, wow. Wow, that's, that's, that's what we're about. We're going to spend our time fussing and fighting over that. When the Lord said his spirit's going to fall on all flesh, who cares who's ordained? If they got the Holy Ghost, I don't care if you're ordained or not. If you have the Holy Ghost, who cares? If the Lord will speak through an ass, Don't mess with me. <laughs> I, I'm gonna say, my argument is not, I don't care less about ordination. My, my question is, is why are we arguing about this stuff? When we, when we have bigger fish to fry, what we need to be trying to fix is this legalistic, rule-based behavior modification, paint a scary picture of God kind of religion that we have all grown up in. That our, that our generation of young people despise. Next. 
James White. Now, now so I'm, what I'm answering now, and then I'm going to open up for questions. What I'm going to answer now is how the how we ended up where we are. All right. Now, y'all know who James White is, right? Yeah. That's, that's the prophet's husband. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> like you're married to a prophet. But he was still the leader of his home. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing there. <laughs> Ellen tries to prophesy. He said, listen here, this is my housewoman. <laughs> By the authority of the word of God. <laughs> There, you know, it's, it's funny. Oh, that's a whole other discussion. But there, you know, when we do these marriage talks, there's, uh, you know, Ellen and her husband had serious contentions in their marriage. Serious contentions. And he would try to pull rank on Ellen and basically say, I don't care if you're a prophet. Uh, this is, I mean, this stuff is published. It's crazy, man. But anyway, I, I, re- I say that to say this, that the early, the early uh, um, uh, uh, the founders of our church were human. They were not walking, they were walking around with long skirts on and stuff like that because that was the culture and style back in those days. <laughs> not, not as, a, I mean, listen, they were cool. They were innovative. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. They were innovative back then. We were one of the first denominations to put this thing called a steamboat on a river to go and preach the gospel. But we have gotten so hooked on church must be this way. Sabbath school at 915, church at 11, AYS. We have to do it like that. We have to, and we have, if we do it any differently. Next. <laughs> so the way that they did evangelism in those days is, so, you know, we have PowerPoint, like keynote. This is, so, this, this, so this picture, they would stand this picture up in the halls where they did evangelism, these arguments, and they would put this picture up and they would preach the picture. Yes. Now, the title of this picture before they received the understanding of the gospel was the, the way of life. So if you look at this picture, what does it say the way of life is? Yeah, the, law. The, law. the law. What's center? Yeah. The commandments. Yeah. Hanging on the tree of life. <laughs> Do you get the message that's being sent? Yeah. That the commandments get, are the keys <laughs> to eternal life. Yeah. And, and Jesus is, Jesus is, he's just placed uh, conveniently off to the side. <laughs> Just put him here, but the commandments are there. And then, as 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 these two brothers, um, um, E. J. Wagner and A. T. Jones, they were young brothers. They were young brothers. They were like in their twenties. Oh, I love it. The chains started to shift. I hope you I hope you're smelling what I'm cooking right now. The chains had to shift with a group, a generation of young people who stood up to the brass in the church and says, "Thus saith the Lord." They discouraged these guys so badly that they end up leaving the church. But Ellen White approved of their ministry. And these guys helped to shift Ellen White. Now, this is crazy. You know that the Lord is with you when your ministry as a young adult is so anointed that Ellen White shifts her thinking because of your ministry. So these guys came up around the 1880s, right? And they were like, man, no, 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 no. The law is not our centerpiece. It's Christ. And so show them the next one. So James White says, we got to change this thing. Now listen what James White says. Listen to this. As he is getting ready to die. It's 1881. James White dies in 1882. Now on his dying bed, this is what he, he's, he's, he's crying out to all of us. Like Adventists, don't lose your way. Look what he says. He says, I feel assured that there is a crisis before us. He says, we should preserve our physical and mental powers for future service. Now watch this. Keep going. The glorious subject of redemption should long ago have been more fully presented to the people. You know what he's saying, right? Somebody help me out. What is is James White saying? Yes, we should have been focusing on Christ long time ago, but we have not. Watch what he says goes on. He says, with some, there is an unutterable yearning of the soul for Christ. And the writer is one of this class talking about him. He's saying, and I need Christ. He's saying, he says, with some of us, it has been business, work, and care, giving Christ but little room in the mind and in the affections. Keep, keep stepping, my brother. He says, with others, it has been nearly all theory, 
dwell, now don't miss this, dwelling upon the law and the prophets, the nature and the destiny of man and the messages, the messages, the three angels messages. He said, we've dwelt on that, the law, the prophets, the three angels messages. He says, while destitute to an alarming degree of an indwelling Christ. James White is analyzing the current state of Adventism at that time. And he's essentially saying, man, we have not focused on Christ as we should. Doesn't that sound familiar? Keep going. Our preachers, he's, he's still talking. He's getting ready to die. He says our preachers need more encouragement. He says they should preach Christ more. He says, and they should know more of him upon whom all our hopes of success here and of heaven hereafter depend. And no, 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 no this, is the, this is the point you got to catch here. As he's getting ready to die, he says, he's prophesying. He says, I have workmen that shall take hold of this work. He said this in 1881. The Jones, uh, uh, Jones and Wagner came around in around 1886, 87. The spirit of God told James White, I'm going to raise up some young people. <laughs> oh, this is good. Who are, go who are going to go back to the roots of Christ and his love. He said, they've not come yet, but they're on the way. <laughs> oh my, this is good. He said, they're coming. He says, fear not, be not discouraged. It shall go forward. The ministry of Christ. Go on. Yeah, next, next slide. Next slide for me. So then they had to change. They changed it. James White commissioned the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Review and Herald. He said, he says, get rid of that old poster. With the beasts and Jesus in the background. Like Jesus is just like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just enough Jesus so people will know we're Christian, right? But when they reframed it, he said, I want the preachers to use this when they preach. Do you see it? Who is at the center? Christ. And, and then there's heaven. And then there's the, the Lord's Supper. Then there's the, the altar of sacrifice. And, and the commandments. I, I can't even see it on this resolution. But the commandments are somewhere on, on Mount Sinai. Somewhere. The emphasis should have been Christ. That's in 1883. After James White died, Ellen White says, get it done. Are you here? All right. I'm almost done. I'm going to show you a few more. And we're going to open up. So God to Ellen White as James White is dying. This is what God said to Ellen White as James is dying. She says this, she says, it was there I understood that I was to take the work and burden stronger than I ever have borne before. Ellen is acknowledging that prior to that, there was, she was not emphasizing Christ as she should. Ooh. Oh, man. She says, now I got a burden that I've got to take this stronger than ever before. Watch what she says, keep going. With the understanding that God was to bring an element in this work that we have not yet had. You know what that is? The grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not prominent in our, in our church. Go on. Ellen White then, after that statement, she moves to California. And she hears those two young preachers. Then 1888. They had that controversial general conference session in Minneapolis. And it was, Ellen, it was essentially Ellen White, two young preachers against the whole establishment. And they shut her down. That's why Adventism is the way it is. They shipped her down to Australia. But she would not be silenced. She began to pin steps to Christ. <laughs> Desire of ages. Come on, somebody. Do you see it? Do you see the struggle, the tension that's happening in our church? Sometimes people use Ellen White and James White to represent this old guard of restrictionism. Not so. She was fighting for freedom in the church. And they try to shut her mouth. Oh my God. Onward. Now watch what she says. She supports him. She says, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. She says, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the world. All right, I'll, 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 this is the message. Go back, go back. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. Now watch this. It is the third angel's message. I'm done. Now that's that. Like if, if you Adventists at all, that should have that should have rocked your world. Y'all know what the third angel's message is, right? Don't receive the mark of the beast. You know she says the interpretation of that is Christ and Him crucified. She says 
The third angel's message in verity is the righteousness of Christ. We're not supposed to be scaring people out of hell. Presenting conspiracy theories of the Pope infiltrate uh, 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 Jesuits infiltrating the Seventh-day Adventist church. All right, let's let's take some questions. Questions, comments, anything. Um, yeah, my... Skip to number one for me. There's a slide that says number one because it will help to answer some of the questions that will come forth. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so certainly, I'm, I, I believe in what you uh, shared that Christ has been sent to these and we have in verity lost it. Uh, I mean, we grew up. I'm sure all of us grew up in a very Mm-hmm. Despite the knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, so the, the notion it's hard to is, shake. It's hard to shake. Yes, it is. Real, it's hard to yeah, shake. me too. And, and, and part of the rationale for why we set up Metro was to have love at the center that people would feel the love of God mm-hmm. so much so that they'd want to come back because we're meant to represent Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do we really shake this history that? seems to dog us because even if you set something up new, it's still there. This, yeah. this, how, how do you shake that? How do you break free from that? What does it look like when you're breaking free and representing Christ in its fullness, where there's no longer a fear of the law, there's a respect <coughs> of the law, but not fear of the law? Mm-hmm. Because you know the law can't save you. You've been reading Galatians in the Sabbath school quarterly. Even if you haven't, you should. And out of all the Sabbath school lessons, I, I strongly recommend you read this one. But, um, Errol ans- asks such a loaded question. All right. So let me, let me, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, let me respond by saying it like this. Essentially, how do we get over the, the past that seems to haunt us still to this day? Let me be a prime example of this. I still struggle with legalism, especially in raising my kids. Now, it's like I, I receive grace easily, you know, because I know I need it. But when I'm parenting, my parenting is not gospel parenting. It's cultural. It's black. It's all fear. It's fear base. Fear base. Make me proud. One of the brothers was mentioning that today. Like, really, you know, we have aspirations for our children not because we are wanting God's will to be fulfilled in their lives, but we want them to make us look good. Yeah. Right. So here's the short answer. I think the answer is in what Ellen is saying. We need to become obsessed with Jesus in the context of the great controversy. What that simply means is, is that Jesus is the answer to the lie that God is mean God is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's temperamental. He, he, he's critical and he needs you to be a certain way if he's going to love you. That is the purpose of Adventism. The whole great controversy is what? Somebody tell me. Satan is lying saying God can't be trusted. That's a great controversy. And what we're supposed to be saying is, yes, he can. So I think we need to really, really be committed. And it takes a quite a bit of intentionality. It's easy to do it in church. But it's hard to do it in your personal life. Like, let me, let me tell you something. Let me help somebody. If you sin and you make a mistake, right? And you, and you again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You've got to reinforce in your mind that Jesus loves you. And if you have repented of it once, twice, three times, he forgets that you did it a thousand times before. But because, that, because th- there is nothing in society that you can look toward as a model for that. You, it is totally, it's outside, it's outside the realm of the human capacity to understand the love that Christ has for us. Scripture says nothing will separate us from the love of God. But how many of you like me, you do something wrong and you feel like, man, I, I got to 
there's a few things I need to get, get together. I, you know, sometimes, I, you know, you even skip devotion because you're afraid to talk to the Lord because you did the wrong thing. And he's saying, come to me. But the only way you would think opposite of that is if you have what he's saying, this history, this history in your mind. But reject it. Know that that history is not biblical. It's not who God is. It's just what it is. It's history. Some, now, listen, I don't want to poo-poo on everybody. Our people meant well. They meant well. But I believe that truth is ever increasing from glory to glory. And God gave them a word during that season. But now, now that we know better, now that we know better, and that it's about Christ's righteousness and his grace, then we need to be committed to sharing that. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Okay, my question is more based on the spirit of prophecy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where we are having a generation of people who don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. So you could be teaching this right now, but people at the back of their heads thinking, uh, is it really true what it should be? So what would you say to us? <laughs> oh. So yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Like when you share this stuff, it's almost like, really? Ellen White was like that? Yeah. Compared to all the other stuff? Look, I say it like this. If somebody took your conversations that you said over your lifetime, and, and, writ, and, and wrote them down and then just let everybody read them it's easy to take what you're saying out of context depending on circumstance and situation now let me say this Ellen White would be the first person to say you don't need me in order to be saved you don't need Ellen in order to be a good Adventist she is the prophet to the remnant church which is to say she was raised up for the express purpose of giving us guidance to look toward Jesus. Ellen herself said, I'm the lesser light. Look, in one, in one statement, which I often put up when I do this, I didn't do it this time. She says, stop quoting me and quote the Bible. Now, I strongly recommend that you read her in light of what you saw today. Is that good stuff? What you saw? Is that free? Is that liberating? But we must... Forgive me for saying this. I'm employed in the States, so I will not. It's all right. I don't like compilations. You know what a compilation is? Okay, I don't, 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 I don't do compilations. I, I don't have to. You know why? I got the Ellen White app. So if you send me a statement and it says something about eggs on the table, you remember Ellen White made a statement, no eggs on the table, right? Or, or the eating of cheese is wholly unfit for food and stuff like that. But Ellen White ate beef all the way up until she died. <clears throat> now, that's not license to eat beef. It's just that her, her, her version of health reform was to eat the best option available for maximum health. So if she's on a train, there's nothing else to eat, and all they're serving is beef. Ellen would have had it, as she as she has done, and it's all it's all recorded. I don't know where I was going with that. I got caught up caught up on the, on the beef, but but what was, what was it? Yeah, yeah. The compilations are dangerous because they take things out of context. All right. So what I I have the Ellen White app. If you send me a statement, I can look at the whole thing in context. All right. But I'll just encourage you to do this. Her commentary on the Bible is called the Conflict of the Ages series. That's Desire of Ages. Well, no, that's the start beginning. That's Patriarchs and Prophets. Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and the Great Controversy. If you want to get the essence of what Ellen was about, read those books. Mostly everything she wrote after that was written to a particular person in a particular situation. And then somebody took it and then applied it to you. I don't know if I answered your question, but okay. All right. Anybody else? It's four. It's four eleven. It's more time. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so should we believe the stuff that she wrote? Say it again. Should we believe the stuff that she wrote? 
Absolutely. I don't think Ellen White loses credibility because she wrote a personal letter to somebody else. I mean, it's funny. We'll read Max Lucado and we won't feel any type of way, even though he writes things that we don't agree with. But then when it comes to Ellen White, we get real skittish.